Welcome to the Higher Points, and uh, today we got a special guest on, Jason Prost. He is our representative here in the Hutchinson area for Kansas, and we're just going to pick his brain, chat with him a little bit. We want to hear, like, why he does what he does and, like, his drive, and just, uh, we'll just let him take it away and t- tell us a little bit about Jason, so. Sounds good. <laughs> And so it all began one day when a, when a man loved a woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the entry into the state legislature might be a little less romantic than that. <laughs> um, you know, I just I grew up in Nickerson, and mm-hmm. I think you guys are from Nickerson too, out in that yep. area, right? And uh, so I, life's pretty simple out in that area, and I, I grew up there, and then. Uh, really didn't know what I was going to do with my life and just kind of wandered around. But I ended up having kids very early. I was uh, 19 when uh, we got pregnant, 20 by the time my daughter was born. And so then that pretty much determined, uh, at least for a while, where my life was going to go because I had kids to take care of. Uh, so I've done a lot of things over time. I worked, uh, I owned a restaurant at 21. Uh, that didn't work out very well. Then I came back to Hutch at that point. That was out of town up in McPherson County. Um, actually Harvey County. I worked in McPherson for a while, but then I had the restaurant over in Harvey County, but I came back, um, to Hutch. I worked at, uh, mega manufacturing aero machine as a CNC lathe operator out there, learned how to set the machines up and do all that. But I knew pretty quickly I didn't want to do that forever, so I started going to school at night. So I'd kind of like bring a backpack with me with my books and my clothes, and I'd go wash up after work and then go down and take classes at night. And I did that for a number of years. And then uh, when they started laying people off after 9-11, things kind of the economy went sour. So they started laying people off, uh, and it it took a while to get to me, but then it finally did. And then in uh, 2002, I got laid off, but then I, by some combination of weird circumstances i ended up at the hutchison news and i I worked there for 15 years started out designing pages moved into reporting and then by the time uh at the end the time i left the news i uh i was editing and kind of managing the reporters and doing things like that and then uh we got bought by a big corporation i wasn't particularly thrilled with that because we've been a family-owned company um when did that happen that that happened in 2017. Okay. May, may have been 16, but the, it was somewhere around 2017, I think, early early in the year. Mm-hmm. I've seen that happen with a lot of uh, newspapers, even like Sterling Bulletin's gotten bought up by a bigger, you know, bigger publication. Yeah, it's kind of been the trend in, in newspapers over the last 10 years or so. The uh, small and midtown papers get bought up by a a bigger company and then that company gets bought by a bigger company right now the hutch news is owned by a company called gannett and they are the same paper that they're the same company that produces usa today and they own some of the the they they actually own most of the papers in the u.s at this Mm -hmm. point um most of the newspapers are owned by uh unless they're small independently owned and there are some of those that are still actually doing quite well i have a friend who's uh, growing actually but he's doing small weeklies and he's really community focused and 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 does good work in that area but any of these other papers of any size they're 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 getting gobbled up by big corporate interest and and in my view uh they just come in and kind of take all the take all the wealth and take all the money out of a out of a paper out of the community and then when they've done that they usually sell them off one one by one so I wasn't really excited about working for a company like that. And then, did I, you ever see like the reporting change as far as like did they have agendas that they pushed down or anything? Or well, I didn't stay with that company long enough to see kind of how that was playing out. I know in our newsroom, it was uh, the whole time I worked there it was very organic. I mean, the reporters, you know, I may have had ten reporters, and they all had different ideas on what we ought to be covering and how we ought to write it, and we would have meetings every day to talk about that. And we'd have weekly meetings to talk about longer-term planning. Um, so when you have a community newspaper like we had here in Hutch, it's really focused on what is of interest to people in the community, what's going on in the community, what do people need to know about. And I really appreciated that. I think what we see now, um, these big companies, they own all these papers. You know, Gannett, actually, they own Garden City, Dodge City, Salina, Hayes, Leavenworth, uh a bunch of others too. So then to to save money and save on staff, they just populate 
the content in all the papers. You, you'll you see a Hutchison story in the Garden City paper, and you'll mm-hmm. see a Garden City story in the Hutchison paper, and then they'll throw in some of their national reporting. And that way they can run that paper with a very, very lean staff, and they're not producing a ton of local content. I think the reporters that are there are trying the best they can. There's just not enough of them. Um, so what you, what you end up seeing is more of kind of a – it's kind of homogenous, right? You're going to be getting much the same information in Leavenworth as you are in Hutch and Garden City because they're kind of combining all that content together. So what did what did you do what when you when you decided to leave? What was the next step? So what happened in 2017? Um, I'd actually been approached in two, 2016. There was an election for the state uh, mm-hmm. legislature, and uh, before that race, I had been approached by both Republicans and Democrats to run for office. At the time, I didn't feel it was right for me. I, I just wasn't in a position where I thought I could take on that kind of challenge. Uh, so a friend of mine had also been approached. Her name was Patsy Terrell, and she ran for office. And she, you know, her and I had conversations about all that. And she had said, you know, if you're not going to run, I think I'd like to. And I said, you should run. It seems like you're ready for it. And I'm not. And uh, so she did, and she ran, and she won, and she served the first year of her term. And at the very end of that, uh, it was a very dramatic session. There were a lot of big changes in policy that were made that year. And uh, at the at the end of that session, uh, she died. Uh, She they they found her um, after a a big vote that day um, that actually changed fundamentally tax policy in the state. they found her the next morning in her hotel room and she was, she was unresponsive and she had died. So it was right around after that people that knew the situation with her and I and the conversations we'd had, um, started contacting me and saying, I think that you should probably fill out her term that, that, that would be what we'd want to happen. So I thought about that. Um, I was on a bike ride. I do bike across Kansas every year that I can. Mm-hmm. And I was in the middle of nowhere and I was on my bike and you get a little loopy when you're, riding a hundred miles a day and in the heat. <laughs> and so I was just like, why not? I guess I'll quit my job <laughs> and go in the legislature. And, and that's what I did. And the, the local people uh, selected me to fill that spot. I filled it out uh, the 2018 term. Um, at the end of 2018, I had to run for election. I didn't have an opponent that year. So I won. And then I had to run again in 2020 and I won that, but barely. And then I have to run again this year in 22. Do you have an opponent this year? It looks like I will. Yeah, so far I have one opponent, same opponent I had last time. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. so, uh, bike across Kansas is cool. Um, I, I'm a police officer in Sterling, and okay. so like w- they had like when when Taggart Wall was our city manager, there was a big like celebration there one time. Mm-hmm. Essentially, like a bunch of people came, and it's always cool to see the people come through. And we always end up getting hit up about like, hey, can I camp here? Can I stay here? Where do I stay? Uh, most of the time what we get is, cause during that time it's, it's the, it's the storm season uh-huh. and more normally it's the, Hey, I've been noticing that a storm's coming in. If I need to go put my head between my legs, where do I do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's usually, it's like right around the corner at our school. It's always open during stormy times. They always unlock it so you can hit the storm shelters and stuff. But I think a bike across Kansas is interesting. Uh, how, how many miles is that? This year it's 512 miles across the state. And how long would that take? you know, your average person to do? Well, on this route, it takes, uh, it's scheduled for eight days. So you start, if you can, if you want to do the early start, um, it starts the 11th. We'll go, most of us will go up on the 10th and we'll do the short ride from the Colorado border to Syracuse, Kansas. And uh, then Saturday morning, we'll start riding and we'll go across the state and we'll end up at the, at the final, at the Missouri state line on the next Saturday. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a full week plus, plus a day if you want to do the, if you want to do it right the way I, I would say doing it because it's nice to get set up on that first night and have everything there and not have to worry about that. But yeah, it's a, it can, it can be rough and the daily miles are anywhere from generally between 40 something miles and 80 miles. It just kind of depends on how the, how the route falls and, and where it goes, but Generally, like this year, there's several 70, 76 mile days, a couple of 50 mile days. So they even put in one of those, um, like bicycle, like tool station things mm-hmm. at our, at our lake. So that, you know, people that were coming through like that had, and it's got 
all kinds of tools, like things that I look at it and I'm like, I have no idea what that's even used for. <laughs> yeah, you see, and it's all these weird tools, yeah. right? Like tire levers so you can pop yep. your tire off and uh, different different tools that are very specific to bicycles. Yeah. And you, it's, it's got a built-in air pump and everything on it too. It's nice. Yeah. yeah, those are nice when you have those up and you need, you know, you're getting a flat tire and you're trying to limp your bike home. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good it's a good thing to have. Well, do you get like support staff on that? Like what you see in, uh, is, is this like a like a sanctioned race type thing? Is it, or is it just like a fun thing? It's more like a fun thing. Okay. It's a, but, but it is an organized ride and it's a supported ride. So it's, it's really nice where you can you can pack your bag in the morning and get what you need for the day and then you throw your bag on a truck and they drive that truck to the next city and when you get there you find your bag you unload your stuff set up your tent whatever you need to do and you don't have to pack that stuff with you i've done the ride across the state well the last two years we canceled because of covid and and the the schools were really apprehensive about having a bunch Mm -hmm. of people in the building and everything so we we couldn't really pull it off the last couple of years. So a couple of friends of mine and I got together and did our own self-supported ride. So that's where you have your bags on your bike and you're packing your tent and you're packing all your stuff. And that's I think my, <laughs> it, well, I think my bike, which normally weighs somewhere around 18, 20 pounds. Um, when I put all that stuff on, I think it weighed like 70 something pounds. <laughs> it was, and it takes a little getting used to cause, and if you don't pack those bags, like if you're heavy on one side, like you're going to have a bad time, right? Mm-hmm. Cause you're constantly trying to pull that bike up because the weights want to pull the one side or the other. So you got to think about that when you pack, when you're doing that kind of ride, you make sure you have basically the same weight from one side to the other, because if you don't, it's, it's pretty rough. I imagine that that ride was a little bit different than what you were used to considering if you were used to what, 18 pounds, you said? Oh yeah. Oh I yeah. Imagine. Did, so were you able to still get the 40 or whatever miles in? Oh, we got some long days in, some, some very long days. We actually last year, um, you know, coming out of the legislative session, it runs from January to April. We take a break in April and then we come back usually in May for a little bit. And then there's another break. And depending on how things go, we either come back at the end of May or early June to just do the last final day and wrap up. Um, and I can't get any training done. Like I, I, I have this dream every year that I'm going to train. I'm going to go up <laughs> this year. I took my bike up, had a, a stationary trainer for it. And I was going to set my bike up in that. None of that happened. I get up there. I get so busy. I get so kind of into what I'm doing and I just didn't have any time to practice. So every year I come out of this, I've got to, I've got to hurry up and try to train and try to get myself in shape. Well, last year I went out and the first day I was on gravel. I'm not experienced on gravel. And I was out of shape and my legs cramped and I had more. I mean, it was awful. And we were supposed to make it to Garden City that day, I think. And I think we only made it to Lakin and decided that I probably needed to stop and drink some pickle juice <laughs> and get rid of the cramps and get myself in a little better state of mind so mm-hmm. I could go on. But we still made it across the state. You ever tried mustard packets for I cramps haven't. like that? Mustard packets are good for cramping. Oh, that's good to know. And yeah. it's, I mean, just what, like if you, if you're just trying to like maybe limp to that, like a little bit longer, mm-hmm. like several, several packets of mustard kind of help with that as well. Oh, that's good to know. Cause yeah. that's a lot easier to carry than pickles. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking was <laughs> pickle juice versus mustard. Um, I, I, and, and at first when I heard that, I was like, no way. But then one day I was, I had a, a cramp. So I just took like a, a spoonful of mustard and sure enough, like. Not very long thereafter. All the, right. This the is way. this is great. You, you may have changed my whole biking experience. Dude, with he's, that. he's gonna be, he's gonna be in the middle of nowhere, going, "This is not working." He <laughs> lied to me. Not not having any pickle juice. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna come back to Hutchinson and look me up and try to find me to beat me up. It'll be like it's just a cruel joke to get somebody to eat mustard all day long, right? <laughs> so um, so like, so what is the so. I guess after we, we, you taught, we, I guess we kind of got into bike across Kansas and we may have interrupted you there. Um, what was after, after the paper? And then you went into the legislative thing and then you said you quit your job basically mm-hmm. and, and did that. So, so that was kind of where we were at. So is that kind of what you're still doing and what you're still focused on or do you have other side gigs or anything like that or? Well, you have to have some side gigs because the legislature doesn't pay very much. It's the pay is $88 a day while we're in session plus a per diem. Uh, but during session, we all have to rent rooms and things up in, in Topeka. So the average legislature does not make a whole lot of money. Um, 
and it's not enough to to really live on. So mm-hmm. um, the first couple of years were a real struggle. I had to piece some things together and do some different odd jobs. And I I did everything from um, helping a friend of mine who was working on a flip house. So I helped him out a little bit, and he paid me. Um, I did some contract work with a, a couple of companies here in town just to do some writing, since that's what I'd done before. Um, one year I had to, um, well, I worked for a marketing company for a while. Then I worked for down at Carl's. I worked at, I was, you know, slinging, making sandwiches and slinging burgers down at Carl's for a while. Um, now I have a pretty steady contract that I do for a chain of nursing homes and I do their newsletter and, uh, I'll pick up a couple of things every now and then, but that, that provides me at least a I mean, I'll get rich off of it, but it at least allows me to pay the bills. Is that by design so that you could kind of focus on the legislative session when you were there? Um, yeah, it's a, it, you mean the piecing things together? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, well, it, I'll tell you, it's honest. And I hear this complaint from a lot of people. It's, it, it's kind of hard to find a job if you're in the legislature. I mean, you're basically, you, you got to find somebody who's willing to pay you a yearly salary or pay you, you know, by the hour or whatever, but then also, be willing to i mean when you're in topeka you're in topeka you're there monday through friday generally and uh it's all all week every week at least january february march and again part of april um a lot of people myself included have not had a lot of luck i mean i did apply for some jobs initially but the the standard answer i got back was yeah we don't know how we're going to make that work you're going to be gone four or five months out of the year other employees are going to have questions about how come they can't take four or five months off or whatever? Mm-hmm. And so I, I just kind of thought, yeah, it's, I mean, it's probably as long as I'm doing this, it's probably not going to work to get like a standard regular job and I'll need to just figure it out myself. So what is a, what is a typical day when you are in session look like? I mean, if you're just to kind of walk through like what, what time does it start? And then what, when, how do you work through a day? Well, no, there's nothing typical. Uh, there's no typical day, but <laughs> because everything is different, you don't know what you're going to be dealing with from day to day. But generally, um, I try to get I try to get into the Capitol building usually between seven and eight in the morning, and I get in and check my emails and try to read up on on uh, whatever news happened the night before, whatever things I need to be paying attention to. Usually, have a uh, committee meeting at nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, I didn't have one this year because I was in leadership, so I was able to, uh, in the minority party leadership, so I left my morning open so I could do some planning and have some other meetings that I needed to have. But in years previously, I would go to committee at 9 in the morning. Those usually last about an hour and a half, and there you have people coming in and testifying, and you're hearing on bills and and asking questions and, and doing that work. Uh, that first committee usually gets done about 1030. We're on the floor every day at 11. Uh, so you get about 1030, you usually schedule appointments in 15 minute increments from 1030 to 11. So you'll get one person come in. They want to talk to you about their issue they're concerned about or a constituents in town. You'll talk to them for 15 minutes. Then another one comes in for 15 minutes for between 1045 and 11. And then 11 o'clock, you're on the floor. Uh, and that's where everybody in the in the house chamber is together in one room, all 125 of us in, in the room. Uh, and we never know what we're going to do that day. Sometimes people get up and they want to recognize people from their community. And so they, they call those points of personal privilege. So we'll have people come in and talk about that. And uh, sometimes we have uh, – there's a lot of reading of bills. Like if bills have been introduced, the clerk will read those in. Sometimes we're there for – 15 minutes and we're gaveled out. Uh, some days we're there for an hour uh, doing points of personal privilege or uh, finding out what's going on. People will make announcements about meetings that are coming up this week. On days that we're actually debating bills, you have no idea how long you're going to be there. I mean, if you have four or five heavy bills and there's going to be a lot of debate and a lot of amendments on it, you, you could be there um I mean, you literally all day and well into the night. I mean, we've you guys had some pretty late sessions here towards or nights towards the end of the session, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, we had a couple. And actually, this year wasn't as bad as some previous years. Mm-hmm. I mean, this year we were generally, I think, the latest nights we had were around one o'clock in the morning. But <laughs> we've the we, latest night. Whoa, yeah. But we've had years before where we're there. 
uh, till three, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Goodness uh, gracious. Yeah. And there was one year, um, we were, it was the last day of the session and we were on the floor, gaveled in at eight o'clock in the morning and we were there all day and all night and we didn't gavel out until nine o'clock the next morning. So it was 25 hours of straight <laughs> debate and session. I mean, debating bill. Some of that you can get up and leave if it's kind of dragging on or whatever. Um, but the expectation is, is that you're there and you're, you're here in the debate. And when it comes time to vote, you'll be there to vote on it. Huh. <laughs> yeah. I, I never like my mind's eye, of course, me not understanding my mind's eye was like that eight to five, you know, or maybe that eight to four with an hour or two lunch break kind of in the middle. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot that, of, I think that's cool. I think that's admirable, honestly, from, from the outside looking in of like that y'all are willing to do that and, and put, for, put for that very little in. pay from the state. Yeah, no and, kidding. Yeah. You know, you're not like Congress where you're giving yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in raises or anything. Yeah. So not that I'm saying you don't deserve any of it, but no, it's, it's kind of funny. People, uh, sometimes people, uh, don't see, they don't really recognize the difference between like a state legislator and somebody in Congress. Mm-hmm. And so it, sometimes it, they think you're just they like, think I'm, yeah. you know, making bank. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not, that's those guys in DC. That's not me. I'm not, I'm not making that. I've, I've only got one yacht in my pond. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's eight inches long. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, we do debate those bills and some, but, but, Sometimes I'm frustrated by that because it, it's not completely necessary. Some some days we we've heard like over thirty bills in a day before. Like you you get the list the night before, and it's here are the thirty bills that we're going to vote on tomorrow. And so th- when that happens, then you're like scrambling to make sure that you know something about these bills. You know that you you kind of rely on people who who know more about them. Like if they come out of a committee, I'm on the agriculture committee. Hardly anyone who's not on agriculture is going to pay attention to what's happening in agriculture. So they're going to kind of rely on people like me who are on that committee to say, well, this is what happened when we debated and discussed this bill in committee. And we kind of prepare information for everybody to say this is, you know, this is what we think of the bill. This is what we remember coming out of this debate. Um, But sometimes uh, it it seems like if we managed our workflow a little better, we wouldn't have to do that uh, that long a night. And, and frankly, sometimes I feel like those really late nights are kind of a way to break people. Like if they, if there's something controversial. Just to get them to vote kind yeah, of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you, if you can hold somebody there till two, three o'clock in the morning and they're tired and they're ready to go and they get a little bit, you know, loopy, uh, you can, you can get them to vote just out of frustration, right? Or you can get them to vote out of, and it is a, it's a fairly common means of, of getting people to comply. Uh, with with the process. So, do you get bills that are like thousands of pages that like it's impossible for you to read and keep up on them? Like you hear that happen, you know, at the federal level. Do you get ones like that? It's not as common at the state level, but certainly things like if we're making the budget bill every year, the budget bill is huge because it touches every part of state government. It's basically uh, it's a it's a turning math numbers into a bill. So the bill itself is huge. So definitely on that, that's a, that's a situation where you, you, that is kind of boiled down to what we call budget profiles, and that is a numerical version of the bill that you can look at, and it shows you what what the spending is this year, where it's being spent, what the difference is from the previous year, and uh, which departments are seeing increases, which departments are seeing decreases, and things like that. So, yeah, I don't even try to read a budget bill. I, I, I look at the uh, the research department puts out information. It's like a budget summary. And that to me is, a, I'm going to retain that a lot better than if I try to read a, a thousand page bill that says, uh, we're changing this statute, uh, where the budget was, you know, X number of dollars and it will be replaced with this line that says it's now this many dollars, you know, that just gets, that gets, uh, too, too overwhelming. Yeah. So backing up to the committees, um, how, so how important are those? Like, you know, you have people that come and do in-person testimony, mm-hmm. but you also have like written testimonies too. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you're having to like read during that committee time? Or is that just for the in-person testimonies or the, those, those written testimonies get read to you or are you expected to read them or your staff or anything like each, that? Or? Each member is expected to read those. So okay. the, they send that out 
um, we get, you know, it goes through the chair of the committee. And if, if people submit that testimony, that generally goes out uh, in, in different forms. Now, it used to be we all had paper copies in a folder, you know, then that was and when we went to committee, the, the copies of the of the testimony was right there with us. Um, but now a lot of it's done electronically. So they'll put it in Dropbox or they'll um, email it out to you. And then you can go in and look at that and go through the testimony. And if, if you have time and you can, you can look at it ahead of time. So when you go in, you know, uh, what you're doing or what you're going to be hearing. Um, but a lot of times uh, you don't have time for that. So as soon as you get in the committee, you're starting to go through the testimony and look at it. And then you hear people testify. And then a lot of times you hear the testimony. And on the day that you hear the testimony, you're not usually voting on the bill. So you do then have a little time to go back through the testimony. And that's really helpful to me. I've had instances where I've been able to call people locally and say, hey, we're, we're having a hearing. We've had a hearing on this bill. These people have said this isn't going to affect your group. Like, tell me, is that true? Is it not true? And it's helped me make more informed decisions, you know. And sometimes, I mean, this may surprise you, but some people are not honest. And so they're... <laughs> <laughs> this may <laughs> surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> so they sometimes tell their perspective of how something's going to play out, you know, if you pass a piece of legislation. And I think it's always, as often as you can, it's important to check back with people that it will affect locally and say, tell me what, what this means. Tell me what this is going to mean for your your group. Uh, you know, w- one thing I can think of in particular was a, a group that uh, is a, a disability advocates. They work with the disabled population and, uh, I mean, we were being told that this was going to help. And so I ran the bill by some people that work in that field and I, and here locally. And I said, they're saying this. The way I read it doesn't tell me the same thing they're telling me. And I, I want you guys to look at this and tell me what you see. Because I don't want to vote against something that is going to help your mm-hmm. group because I'm supportive of that. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm getting conflicting information. And so they were able to look at it and they came back and they said, we've talked to some of our people, we've looked at it, we've discussed it, we've pulled in some other people who know about this, and they said, this is not going to help us. And I'm like, that's what I needed to know. I just need to know, like, from the local perspective, what that means. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely say, you know, like, one of the things he and I were talking about, which I know we were eventually going to go down this rabbit hole, was when we were talking about the, like, the hemp bill and all the marijuana and all that other kind of stuff, where he was talking about the smokable flower and all that, Mm -hmm. was, like, I was telling him one of the things... On, like for me as a law enforcement on the side of the road, law enforcement officer on the side of the road, how do I tell the difference between a hemp plant flower mm-hmm. and a marijuana flower? Like you set them on the table next to each other and it's like, those are the exact same thing. So I said that might be one of the things that they were thinking about. That might have been one of the things that, you know, that was the reasoning behind that. And I don't know that, but mm-hmm. I, that was just where my mind went of like if somebody could say, oh, no, no, this is all hemp. It's It's fine. It's all hemp. And I'm like, I have to be like. Okay, because I have to prove otherwise. Yeah, um, which is impossible. Yeah, well, without the, you know t- the, sending it to the KBI and doing all that stuff. Well, so. and that's actually one of the things that I remember in the early discussions about hemp and and kind of conforming with the 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 Federal Farm Act on that. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that about how how are we going to know the difference between hemp and marijuana and exactly what you said if i pull a truckload if a guy's hauling a truckload of something (laughs) and he says it's hemp i don't have any way to disprove that unless i pull you know i don't have field testing that can do that i need a kbi i'm gonna have to pull a sample of it and send a kbi what do i do in the meantime so there's a lot of discussion about and it is one of the advantages I, i of having a citizen legislature i think i mean Sometimes I think there are problems with having a citizen legislature, but in, in having a citizen legislature, you pull in people from a lot of different backgrounds. So you pull people from the medical community, you pull people from law enforcement, you pull people from education, and and they all have these different experiences and backgrounds that they bring, and, and they bring their knowledge to the table, and uh, and and so they they can add some insight, you know. And on the ag committee, we have. Uh, one one guy on the committee at least who's uh who's in law enforcement so when these issues come up he says well this is probably how in my work this is how we're we're going to approach this and this is what it's going to mean like he's us. an active law enforcement yes. officer yeah but so is he like appointed to that committee as a law enforcement officer or he's an elected 
he's official. an elected official. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. he's a representative. He's a he's a he's a uh, I think he's a sheriff's officer. Okay. But he's also elected. I thought you meant like in an advisory capacity, like you had say somebody from the highway patrol mm. that sat that board as like an advisor kind of is what, oh, what yeah. I thought you meant in the no, beginning. He's, he's a legislator with it. Mm. And then people, people kind of rely on uh, people who have that expertise to kind of ask them questions and say, Hey, what is this? Uh, what is it? You know, what is it? How's this going to affect your line of work? How's yeah. this going to affect what you do on a daily basis? Well, but I will tell you, you know, some of my colleagues, um, I don't know if you've ever listened to any of our, our podcasts, but I'm like, a proponent of cannabis and hemp and all that other good mm-hmm. stuff. I'm kind of a weird law enforcement officer when it comes to that, but um, is, is, you know, I think some of our law enforcement officers live in an echo chamber when it comes to that stuff, you mm-hmm. know, we're still stuck on the, the, like, here's the, you know, the egg of here's your, here's your, egg, or here's your brain, here's your brain on drugs kind of thing. And marijuana's lumped into that when, you know, there are some, there is some science out there that says Delta nine does increase your dependence and increase anxiety over time. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, cause it binds with the CB1 receptors, whereas CBD, CBG, CBN can actually give you the medical benefits. Um, you know, I still think that like, it's like, we, we need to fully understand that as a whole mm-hmm. and, and law enforcement officers, we all live in a, I mean, I, I can't tell you the last time I made a marijuana related arrest, uh, or, you know, I think I've maybe written one ticket in the last two or three years. And that was just because the guy was being wholly dishonest with me. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I mean, if we, we don't play games, we can play games, but, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes polling those people of expertise can, you know, lead to an answer that's been built in an echo chamber, you know? Well, I agree with that. There's all, there's also the, um, some people, sometimes people ask the question not to get new information, but to confirm the bias they already have. And so we have a lot of people, you know, the legislature by and large is an older generation. It's a lot of retired people, mm-hmm. a lot of people who grew up with the idea that, you know, just say no, okay, and drugs are bad, okay, you know, and things like that, and uh, and and that you know the here's your brain on drugs, yeah. just say no mentality. Um, when we know a lot more now, I kind of encountered that in some circles. Um, one of my big pushes this year was the decriminalization of fentanyl testing strips. Um, it, because which I really am interested in that, by the way. So I really would like to delve into that. Well, if that's we, okay. we can dive into that, <laughs> please. You but you know, to me, it's like. We wrote a paraphernalia statute in 1981, and we've not changed it at all. We weren't dealing with fentanyl in 1981, but I still have a bunch of people in the legislature who think that by decriminalizing something like fentanyl testing strips, we're giving people the the tools to do drugs. And what I tried to explain is, like, it's not – we are so far from 1981. I understand why that statute was written, right? In 1981, you got to think back to what was happening in 1981. You know, we have like crack cocaine yep, epidemic exactly. going on. Yep. We're going in. We know this is a crack house. We walk in. They flushed all the crack down the toilet. There's not a shred of drugs anywhere in the house. They have scales. They have pH testers. They have all these things. And we don't have anything that we can make a case on. So we put into the paraphernalia statute that anything that weighs, measures, yeah, right. packages, or analyzes a drug is paraphernalia. 1981, that makes total sense. Well, and not only that, but but crack is readily, easily identifiable. Like, I can, by visually looking at it, I know what it is. Mm-hmm. Whereas fentanyl, as a law enforcement officer, I've, I've been like, oh, that's meth. Come to find out, no, that's enough fentanyl to kill me. Yeah. Like, 400 times over. Yeah. No, the fentanyl <laughs> thing is so critical and so serious and and we have got to we've got to figure out how to do something about this because it's just killing people and if Are you those look, strips being used all over the united states and other yeah yeah other states i think there are 20 something states that have legalized or decriminalized fentanyl testing strips and and the thing is to the to their credit law enforcement here by and large is saying we're not prosecuting people for fentanyl test strips and and that's good the problem is it, is it without them being formally decriminalized, there's not going to be an organized distribution effort. There's not going to be an organized educational effort or um, access or, or anything ac- like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and if we decriminalize them, there, there are nonprofit and federal dollars that we can pull in to, to purchase fentanyl test strips and get those out to the community and, and stand up some educational programs. We can use, um, we can use, 
agencies to help with that where we can't now because a state agency can't assist in doing something that's illegal. So, so what's the brass tax of the fentanyl test strip? So essentially, it's the, the the statute currently reads anything to analyze. So the fentanyl test strip analyzes whether it's fentanyl or mm-hmm. not, and thus it violates the paraphernalia statute, and you can't have it. So what was the pushback there of like why why on the, the I mean like the true what you, what you truly feel what was the pushback on that why the pushback was because there is uh, someone in the Senate who is running for Attorney General. And she did not want to appear soft on crime in a year that she's going to try to be the state's top law enforcement officer. But I, you're changing literally like, what, a half a sentence? Yeah, three in, words. All I put in the statute to change that was, except fentanyl test strips. I mean, for, I guess four <laughs> words, right? It's like all of this is still illegal except fentanyl test strips. That's all. I mean, we weren't opening up a Pandora's box we weren't doing any of that. We were just trying to take this one very specific thing. And, and to you know, the House was very supportive of that. I didn't have it. Most of the people in the House supported it. It just got into the Senate. The Senate is a much more um, kind of socially conservative bunch over there. And uh, this gal running for attorney general made a stink about it. She got a couple of her friends to make a stink about it. And then everyone else just kind of followed along. But but how are you soft on crime? Because I can't tell you that I've ever, 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 ever prosecuted someone or even seen a fentanyl test strip, in my opinion, to want to to prosecute it anyway. It's not like you have, like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people that you're prosecuting for this every year. And suddenly now these people aren't going to be prosecuted. They aren't going to be through the court system and all this other kind of stuff. So, like... What, what, what's the soft on crime doesn't make much sense. Yeah, I don't the, get it. The quote from her was uh, something of that Kansans will think that we're encouraging or condoning drug use. That's, I mean, that was the quote that ended up from her, that, that by doing this, we would be sending a message to Kansans that we condone drug use. And, and there is a mentality out there. I mean, it's very to me, it's very unfortunate um, that still has this whole kind of well, if you if you make bad choices, you you get bad outcomes, and um, that that thinking is kind of prevalent there. So there that that was in that too that they, shouldn't people take responsibility for what they do? Uh, they make bad choices, shouldn't they have to live with those? And aren't aren't we by doing this uh, creating or making it easier for people to do drugs? And by making it easier for them to do drugs, um, we're complicit in their drug use. And I, I try to explain to them. <laughs> Uh, it, it, this doesn't help people do drugs. This just gives information. Yeah, there, right. There's a huge, I think there's like a, if you were giving out like supposedly like the Biden free crack pipes that you were seeing all over Facebook, like, okay, that encourages some drug use. But like to tell someone that like, hey, this is in here and it could kill you. That's, that's significantly different. That's actually discouraging in my mind. Yeah, they, well, the, the research shows too that when people test their drugs and they find fentanyl, they change their behavior including finding someone else to get their drugs from. Like they go back to their dealer and they say, dude, you sold me fentanyl. You're trying to kill me. And they do that, but they use less. They use uh, in- incrementally um, and they, and it keeps them alive. I mean, that's the, the bottom. And one of the things ab- about this, that I think is s- such a distinction that we have to make. F- fentanyl is a poison and it's a poison that people don't realize is in their drugs. So a coroner, you know, on my podcast, I talked about this, and one of the people I had on was a coroner from Shawnee County. And she said, you know, we're making cases uh, where we go in and we find what looks like Oxycontin, and they're stamped with 30 uh, because that's what's on Oxycontin pills. And then they go and test those, and they're fentanyl. And they call them dirty 30s. Um, And that's what they're finding is that, you know. And then the the U.S. attorney I had on said – for less than a thousand dollars, you can buy a pill stamp, pill press, and you can just make your own pills, and uh, you can load them up with fentanyl, and you're killing. Them. But that's the big distinction to me is that you, you, we can have one conversation about drug use, like of all kinds, and what we might want to do about that. Um, we can say what do we want to do to try to move people off of uh, off of addiction and into recovery, and and all of that. But when it comes to fentanyl. We're, we're introducing uh, uh, an element that is killing people 
and they're completely unaware. And in my mind, that's totally unfair to say, well, you're, they're making decisions, but they're not making informed decisions. And I think we have a tool that we could help make them make an informed decision. Well, and not only that, but their, their brain has physically changed mm-hmm. to the point that if they don't make that decision – to use that substance because they've come addicted to it. And a lot of those people started on, you know, oxy or something like that, yeah. you know, injured a back or whatever. Um, you know, everybody in here knows the opioid crisis. We don't have to, you know, delve deep into that. But like when, when your brain physically is addicted to that and has physically changed the way it is internally, like it's essentially, you know, you have to have that. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you can titrate that dose down with things like suboxone and all that other mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But when you got things like fentanyl on the street that are hitting so much harder, mm-hmm. you know, you're and you're constantly chasing that high and keep doing more and more and more and more and more. You know, I don't think it at that point it's a decision. I don't think those people wake up every day going, "Yay, I've got to go out and spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of my of of dollars and steal from people or steal from my family or whatever." And make this decision. I'm loving this. This is exactly what I wanted out of life. You know, yeah. I don't think those people wake up every day thinking that. Maybe some of them do. Yeah. But I would say the vast majority do not enjoy what they're doing and wish that they could could kick that. Every every addict or every recovered addict that I've ever visited with, and I've visited with quite a few, tell me that they were having a very bad time when they were in addiction. And they didn't want to be there. And... But they also didn't know how to stop it, right. and they were just kind of in a in a loop they couldn't get out of. And you kind of hit on another point that I think is really important too. It, it's not it's not just I want to use air quotes on that. It's not just addicts, right? I mean we we have a pharmaceutical industry that created addicts, mm-hmm. right? And, By intentionally, yes, and they were happy to do it. They. <laughs> We don't dive too into, it. but yes, they falsified the research. They went yep. out and sold doctors on the idea yep. that you can you can prescribe o- opioids um, for moderate pain for moderate pain, yep. and it would be fine. And we have this one study where we didn't provide the context that it that that you know it wasn't even a it wasn't study a, at all, really. No, it was a you know what they told doctors is this is an addictive, and we have this research study that will show this. And all what that really said was. It's not addictive in a clinical setting. So if you're yeah. in a hospital and you do it for five days and then we boot you loose, not addictive. Yeah, yeah. they took like a small cross section of yeah. people that were under the care of doctors mm-hmm. administering specific dosages of that over a short period of time. Yeah, it wasn't addictive there. Yeah. And so that was exactly what they built the entire Oxycontin uh, yeah. platform on. So we created, I mean, the system, the, the medical system created new ad, new addicts who are addicted to prescription drugs who now are dealing with uh, you know, now there's been a pushback and there's been a pullback on you know prescribing um, so they're now dealing with that and they were they were but then hurt. fentanyl just came in and replaced that yeah that that so you can't get it as easily so now I have to go to illicit ways to yep. get it or I'm getting pills that I think are legit that aren't legit and this is also what's killing kids right we're, we're getting story story after story after story of some 16 year old kid who went to a party and took half a pill, half a Percocet, half an Oxy, whatever, and ends up dead because kids have no tolerance for opiates. Um, and, and they're taking this and they're dying. And so we have multiple classes of, of, uh, victims in this. And anyway, that you get me started on that. I could go on all day, but I think that it's something that we're going to have to address. I, I think there's other things too in, in law enforcement, I mean, there's starting to be some retraining, I think, on this that says when we st- we st- that we need to look at overdose uh, deaths when we see those. Um, they're typically viewed as accidents, and I think yes, yeah, I've been retrained on that. Yep. Yeah, and then mm-hmm. now we're starting to say, don't view yes. this as an accident. View this as a homicide. Yep. If and you- we've been we've been trained to work it just like that. Yeah, because there's information, right? You can right. find out who's. Who's peddling fentanyl in your community yep. by treating it like a homicide? Yeah, where does well, that fentanyl come from, origins wise? Like, when did it? It's over. Uh, the easiest way is overseas, and also, um, also like Mexico. Um, usually, overseas is where like the big labs that make it. And correct me if you've heard differently. Um, but like you'll have like you'll have huge labs because if you think about it, fentanyl is actually um, a really good business decision because you don't have to now have a whole field of poppies mm-hmm. that grow in a specific place like Afghanistan and those places. You don't have to worry about the rain or the, the anything like that. You don't have to worry about protecting it. You then don't have to worry about all the stuff you have to worry about with your hemp 
right? Mm -hmm. And then, so then you have to harvest it, then you have to purify it, then you have to go through all those chemical processes, and then you have to move it out of the country, which you're probably having to pay protection money and all Mm -hmm. this other kind of stuff to move it out. So fentanyl is literally a chemical lab, like, you know, pour, you know, baking soda and water, which of course that's not it, but, you know, pour those things together, make a little bit of fentanyl, throw it in a UPS box and ship it to America or ship it to, to Mexico or whatever. And it's, and and you can get, you know, if you were thinking of like a a brick of heroin, if you have a brick of fentanyl, that's like 50 bricks of heroin. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, the math may be off there, but just to give it an idea. So you're moving significantly more product because it's so potent and Mm -hmm. powerful and you've got less of it. And so you can just put it in a UPS box and ship it over Mm -hmm. and make thousands and hundreds, hundreds of thousands of doses out of one UPS box. Yeah. Yeah, most early on, most of it came direct from China. I think yeah, that they would right. ship it that way, yep. and now a lot of it's coming from uh, in trucks and things across the border, um, just being smuggled. Um, but I think some of it's still being shipped over from China. But yeah, it's so easy to it's so portable. I right. mean, it's easy to get into the country. Yeah, um, and so uh, 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 one of the things I wanted to ask about, which this is going to be a complete shift. Okay. <laughs> um, and I was doing some research, uh, on you on the legislature website. And one that really caught my eye is, uh, House Bill 2479, which was, uh, making unlawful the capture or possession of, of ornate box turtles. Oh my God. This is so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask this is because I'm a cop in Sterling, Kansas. Uh huh. Where the turtle races are the biggest deal at, at the Fourth of, at July, the 4th huh? of July ever, and so I'm reading this, and, and I could really care less how, which way this gets voted on, just to let you know. But I, I want to know where this came from and why, and like all that good stuff. Okay. I, tell, tell, tell me the details. So if I can do, I'll do a plug. I did a podcast episode on this on my podcast because I too, when I saw this bill was completely fascinated. And I thought, why <laughs> are we going to make it illegal to have a box turtle? Um, in in that conversation, uh, Jim Gartner was the guy who introduced it, but he introduced it because um, somebody in his district who is a biologist and who works with the zoo came to him and said, uh, we've got to do something about this. It turns out there is an illicit box turtle trade also huh. um, in like, parts of uh, China and Southeast Asia, uh, they don't have a good turtle box turtle population, but they, lo- they have these gardens and they love to have turtles in them. And so people were getting box turtles, just gathering them up and putting them in, they said like a, like a mailing tube, they put them in socks, like especially you get the little ones, they'd put the box turtles in socks and they'd put them in a shipping tube and they'd ship them over. And people were paying like, Upwards of a thousand dollars for huh. for a box turtle, um, because they can't they can't their box turtle population is not good. So so yeah, there was a trade. There's like an a, there's a le- illegal black market trade huh. for box turtles. I'm a damn. And then the other side of that, which this is actually something that you know I think most of us wouldn't know, uh, but there was this biologist from Washburn University that came in and he has been studying turtles and specifically box turtles his entire career. And he said, by the time you notice a decline in the box turtle population, which people that work in the field a lot say, yeah, there's a lot fewer box turtles than there used to be. Um, by then it like, if a, the populations decline to a point that like, it's very hard for them to sustain themselves. Like he said, if an adult turtle has one offspring that lives that's a successful turtle. They, they usually don't even reproduce at a rate to one to one. Huh. Um, so in their survival, they're very vulnerable when they're young. Um, they, when they're adults, they're pretty much indestructible except by cars, uh, which is the biggest threat to them. But anyway, we've seen the decline. They're, they're seeing, uh, the people that work in the field are seeing a concerning decline in the box turtle population. And then they said, you know, at this point, we have this many fewer and it's going to, like what we're trying to do is stop the decline. What we did on that bill um, is actually wildlife and parks is going to work out a regulation that we think will satisfy everything. We didn't want to make it a crime to have a box turtle because of turtle races. That's a a pretty big part of, you know, 
Americana here in the, <laughs> in the Midwest. Yeah. And Nickerson is the same thing. We have box turtle races and uh, uh, frog races and things like that. So we didn't want to make it that there was a penalty. But what we did want to do is make it illegal to get a box turtle uh, with the intent of selling it. And so we wanted to be clear about that. But we did feel like instead of legislation, the best way to do that would be to let the Department of Wildlife and Parks kind of work with people and say what's the best thing we can do. Yeah, I noticed it kind of stalled in committees, what it, what it showed on the on the website. Yeah, we had a hearing on it. And then in that hearing, we said there was kind of an agreement made, you know, kind of not in the meeting, but just among the stakeholders that said if we get this to Wildlife and Parks, they've assured us they'll, they'll write a regulation that makes sure that we're not – uh, allowing people to sell box turtles, but we're also not looking at slamming a five-year-old in jail <laughs> for getting a box turtle for the turtle race. They're going to be the ones that are like finding it anyways, yeah. so it makes sense for them to write All that right, kids, opinion. straight to prison. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your life. Well, so um, I, I Nate was showing me your kind of end-of-session Facebook post. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was, I was uh, fascinated by that as well. It was interesting to kind of see like a, an outside in viewpoint of that, uh, from a very probably 30,000 foot view. Uh, so what was some of the things you were talking about in there say were, uh, like the tax, mm-hmm. uh, ta- the food tax break. Um, and you feel like you more progress could have been made in things that maybe be weren't like you could have made better use of your time. Uh, you want to speak on some of those items? Well, it gets, uh, a little bit frustrating sometimes that th- this year in particular, um, we had a lot of money in in the state coffers this year. I mean, the the after you know COVID eased up, uh, the economy and it's it happened all over the place. But the economy just kind of lit on fire. I think there was a lot of pent up demand. People had some money. Um, there, you know, people I talked to locally, they said, you know, since everything was closed, I I found out how to save money. I wasn't spending as much money as I used to. Um, but there was there there was a lot of tax revenue, and I felt like we could have used that money in some really constructive ways. And I and the food sales tax was of course one of the most talked about things. But I thought that we it cost about four hundred and fifty million dollars a year to completely eliminate the sales tax, the state portion of the food sales tax. We could have done that. I mean, and it wouldn't have hurt our budget at all. Um, but it got caught up, in my view, it got caught up in election year politics. You know the the governor came out. She's a Democrat. She came out very strongly and kind of built uh, a big messaging apparatus around cutting the food sales tax. So then the Republicans who control the House and the Senate kind of said, well, we're not just going to give her that thing to campaign on. So that kind of started this fight between – and it was a political fight. And in, in that, I didn't feel there was any real acknowledgement of what – cutting it fully would have done for people, particularly in a year where we've seen so far about 8% increase in, in food prices. Well, if you can knock 6.5% in tax off of that, you, you've effectively reduced the the inflation rate. To the normal to rate. One and a half percent, yeah, right? right? Mm-hmm. So I, I felt like we could have done that. And I don't think it would have hurt the state budget at all. Um, I think that we could have done more on property tax. There was a little bit of property tax relief. Um I think that we could I know have done mine more. went up like crazy. Well, we knew that was going to happen, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things that happened in the last two years is that property values have gone through the roof, right. and it's that's a it's that's an interesting thing. And there's so much about working in this role that's kind of hard to explain to people because it, it, it everything kind of folds together. But property values went up. Your property taxes went up because your value went up. Right. Your property value went up because Everybody went on a buying spree. I mean, if there was a house available, people were buying it and people had money for down payments and it's just the property values went through the roof. Um, worse in other parts of the country than it is here. At least here, we tend to be somewhat steady in our growth. But yeah, I mean, and, and, and so we knew that the taxes were going to go up and we saw that. And, and, and there was a group of us that were very concerned about that and wanted to s- start exploring some ways to do, um, more property tax relief, which is a complicated and hard thing to do because at the state level, like we only tax uh, 20 mills and we only tax, we tax that for schools. And that's the only property tax the state of Kansas has. Um, 
every other property tax is a combination of local entities yeah. over which the state government can't come in and say, we're going to usurp your taxing authority. I mean, we can, but we have to do it legislatively. We have to say, we're not going to allow these people to tax anymore, but that would be a pretty big thing to do. But we, we basically, if the school district or the college or the city or the county or the township or the special drainage district or flood district, and there's a lot of those, right? And some of those are very good. I don't know if you remember several years ago, there was an issue with the levy out here, and mm-hmm. there's a group of homeowners. Well, they created a, a, a district to pay for the improvements on the levy, but the alternative was that they were all going to have to buy really, really expensive flood insurance. So this was a way to tax everybody in the in the neighborhood who was going to, like, who needed this levy fixed. By doing that, they paid much less in property tax, um, but they saved themselves the, the pain of having to buy a very expensive flood insurance policy. That covers almost nothing anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, sometimes there's a really good, you know, there's a really good use for that. But we don't have control over what the levy is, and we don't have control over what the values are. So the only thing we really can do at the state level, and I think we need to explore different ways to do this, is some sort of rebate program that says, we know your property taxes are high um, and that that's a struggle for you. Um, but based on these income guidelines, property t- uh, property valuation guidelines, we can come back in and give you a rebate uh, basically through your income tax that says – we're going to offset the cost of your property tax through a rebate because we have no way to come in and say lower the property taxes. And we have no control over market-driven uh, increases in property. Hmm. I'm learning so much stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also I think it's fascinating too where you know, you're expected to know about biology. You're expected to know about law enforcement. You're expected to know about finances. You're expected to know about like how to keep children safe. You're expect. I mean, all, all these different things, like you're expected to be an expert on wildlife and parks and, you know, <laughs> um, so how, how does that work? How does it, how do you essentially kind of become an expert in all those fields? Is it, you know, you, you lean heavily on other people or, I mean, like how, how does it work for you? Well, um, I will, I will say that learning things that I would never learn otherwise is one of the best parts of this job. I mean, something, the box turtle was a good example. Not doing this job, there's no way that I end up learning about this black market for box turtles. Um, but the, the, the way I approach it is I try, I have a couple of areas that I try to know a lot about. And then I try to know a, at least a little bit about as many things as I can. Um, but I really do have to rely on people. And we have, you know, each caucus has people uh, in their party who they feel are experts uh, in a certain field. Um, there are people on the other side of the aisle that I view as experts in uh, different areas, and I'll go and ask them what their thoughts are. Um, it really is kind of gathering information from people and then running that through your own value filter to say, okay, now I have this information and now I understand how this works. I understand what the implications are if we make a change. And one of the things I've learned, and this has been kind of a humbling experience, is it, everything in, in, that I've learned in state government is that it's, it's like a tapestry and it's woven together. And if you tug on one string in one place, you're disrupting something somewhere else. Very few things and actually nothing I've seen exist in a vacuum where if you, you make this change to the law, it solves this problem without creating another problem somewhere else. Oh yeah. That's, that's what I've noticed in my career in law enforcement is, is like legislature changes something and then we're all sitting as boots on the ground of like, okay, how do we apply this? Because now I have this question and this question and this question, or okay, like, but this is kind of different than this, or it says this and you know, you're, you're kind of crossing ways of, you know, how, how do you make that? Cause it's like, you know, a fringe, like for instance, the DUI statute, you know, mm-hmm. so it's like something changes on that, like every year almost, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that the, the statute for murder in the state of Kansas is like a paragraph, yeah. but the statute for DUI is like eight pages, you know, <laughs> I, I'm yeah. just like, holy cow, you know, that, that, that shows, you know, just lawyers and politicians and stuff getting together as far as, you know, making up all those, this is and that's and the exceptions and all that kind of stuff is interesting. Yeah. And then as time goes on, you know, there's new realities that come in and, and, 
and people try to address that. Or I remember this was predates me being a legislature, but there was a, a change to DUI laws a number of years ago um, to be more strict. Um, and I think it reduced it to like number two, like your second DUI would be a felony. Well, then we created a lot of people in prison for DUIs, and we were paying upwards of $40,000 a year to house people in prison for DUIs. Well, we came back, uh, not we, because I was in the legislature at the time, um, but we, they came back later and said, well, we got to change this because now, yeah. now we've got people in prison Unintended for DUIs. Consequences. It's always there. There's always something that you, you make one change, and, it, and you learn that you know there's, there's something down the road or something you didn't think about, and it affects another industry or um, – yeah, it's just it's just crazy the way it all fits together. Well, that used to be the same way with like driving while suspended. Mm-hmm. Driving while suspended, third offense used to be a felony. Yeah, and now it's just like your third offense is like a misdemeanor stuff. But I think it's it's interesting how the legislature because I'm I'm a DUI nerd. Uh-huh. Um, that's also why cannabis is fascinating to me. Um, I'm a drug recognition expert, so like what what the pharmacokinetics of how drugs move through your system and the pharmacodynamics of how they interact with each other is absolutely fascinating mm-hmm. to me. And so I think it's interesting how the legislatures addressed DUI in the sense of like the IADs, the ignition interlock devices, mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, so driving while suspended wasn't working, right? People were still driving while suspended. But if I put this thing in their car that they have to blow into, like, and the car won't start if it detects it, like that is stopping people from driving and driving drunk. And I was like, okay, that's good. Yeah. You know, putting people in prison, sure, that stopped people from driving drunk, but at what cost? Yeah. Um, and then it's now it's like, okay, how do I keep this person from having their passenger blow into it? Now we've put cameras on uh-huh. them and you know, it's just that it's that like incremental step that you're talking about of like, okay, we learned this now let's fix it. Well, we learned this now it's fixed it. But it seems like, uh, man, with what, with everything you have going on, I mean, just looking at the list here of just your, just your sponsored bills, um, and sponsored resolutions, there's like such a plethora here of, it seems like there's always something to learn and always something to improve on. And how do you always. even, how do you, how do you prioritize that? How do you decide what, what gets your time and what doesn't or what, what's important <laughs> and, and what doesn't? I'm, I don't, you know, I wish I had a good answer that sounded like I knew what I was doing, but <laughs> it's, it's really largely based. It's, it's kind of like the tyranny of the urgent, you know, it's, uh, uh, I, I have projects, I, I have projects that I'm working on kind of medium term and long term. And then sometimes I have to drop everything I'm doing because this one thing is coming up and that is the most urgent thing. And that then you just kind of dive in and you just learn everything you can about it and try to figure that out um, and, and move on from there. And then something else comes up and you're learning about that. You know, a few years ago, um, Medicaid was one of my big issues. And I spent several years just learning everything I could about Medicaid Medicaid expansion, studying how it went in other states. Uh, they had there was a lot of research that was put out on what the effects were in other states. So I studied a lot of that. Um, then we get a different legislature. It becomes pretty clear to me that they have no interest and appetite for taking up Medicaid expansion. So I still have that knowledge and I still have the file, but that's kind of been pushed back. And then this year, the fentanyl test strip. You know, at the beginning of the year, I had just a basic knowledge of that. Then I said, okay, we're gonna push on this and there's a lot of urgency building around this so now i'm you know dedicating effort to that and a lot of it in the legislature is driven by your committees i mean you you you're never you're never wrong to focus on your committee work so i'm on ag and uh commerce so if i study uh you know economic development programs if i study uh the agriculture bills that are coming through that that that's probably a good place for me to put my effort. And I think that's what a lot of us do up there. We try to be subject matter experts on the committees that we serve on so that we know that information well. Um, and does everybody have to serve in a committee like while they're there? Is that it's uh, not everyone, but generally uh, mm-hmm. you, I mean, they're, they're, everybody serves at mm-hmm. least on one committee and usually two or three um, because that's, that's where the heavy lifting happens. I mm-hmm. mean, that's where a bill <laughs> If a bill doesn't make it out of committee, uh, I mean, it can still make it out, but it's not as good of a process or as clean of a process. But generally, the committee work is where the the bill is really heard. Um, there's less uh, animosity in a committee. There's generally that's not always the case, um, but certainly, like a committee like agriculture, that's really just people who are interested in solving a problem. 
And and I think they work in good faith to try to find out the information and try to talk to people about how do we solve this problem. And if it makes it through that committee process and it makes it through however it's changed, amendments are added, whatever, and it gets out the floor, generally if the if the committee's on board and they say this is good, not always, but generally the House is going to accept that and say, okay, if this is good policy and the, the Ag Committee thinks this is good and we don't have a huge moral objection or there's not a constituency in my location – that's going to object to this, um, then then we can usually move things pretty through pretty well in that process. When it, when the bill makes it to the floor, and like let's say um, it's that like a, a commerce related bill, just to make it easy, and, and somebody has a question on that, can they can they ask that on the floor of someone say like you, like of like I don't quite understand this, or is that or I, I don't know how that works. Like how how do they like kind of clean that up of them understanding because they're not the sus- subject matter ex- expert. That, me on that. That's right. So the process that there's there's kind of a two step process to this. When a bill comes out uh, of committee, uh, it kind of goes on what we what we call a calendar, and then whether that bill goes above the line, which is kind of an internal jargon, that means the bill is taken from the calendar and moved above the line, and that means we're going to debate that bill the next day, and that's decided largely by the majority leader. Uh, he has control of that and he gets to decide which bills come above the line and which bills are going to be debated. And some of that is influenced by people, you know, committee chairs, people that he's working with in the, in the legislature. But once he makes that decision, that's kind of the first stop. Then there's caucus meetings where we talk about, so the Democrats, they have their perspective and they talk about the bill that's going to be up for debate. Republicans get together and have their discussion about the bill that's up for debate. So there's questions asked in that process of the people that are carrying the bill or the committee chair. And then it comes out to the House floor, and we're having that debate on the House floor. Uh, Somebody will carry that bill, and they will talk about what the bill does. And then anybody that wants to ask questions, they can ask questions. Um, The House floor, when we debate bills, it's called the committee, excuse me, the committee of the whole. And it functions as a committee. It's a big committee, 125 of us, but it functions as a committee. Anybody can... Uh, ask questions. They can go to the well and they can ask to have the bill explained. They can make statements that they want to make on it. Um, they can make motions to to amend the bill. Um, it, it it does, and then we take a vote, and we actually take v- two votes on every bill that passes. One vote is by the committee of the whole to advance the bill out of committee and take a final vote. And then after that happens, we take another vote that's called final action, and that's actually the vote on the bill. Um, so there's a lot of steps in that process, but it's very much like a committee process. Do those happen the same day, or is that typically it passes committee and then? Generally, we wait a day. Yeah. Generally, we pass it out of, out of the committee of the whole, and then it sits for a day, and then we take final action the next day. Sometimes when they're in a hurry or it's 3 o'clock in the morning, um, they do what they call emergency final action. Uh, emergency in legislative world can be just about anything. It can be because <laughs> <laughs> I want it to. Because I want it to be an emergency. <laughs> you don't have to declare any. There's no definition of what an emergency is as long as you have the votes. It's an emergency, and so they we we sometimes do that mm-hmm. if we're coming up against the clock and we got to get something done, or it's late at night and we just want to be done and we don't want to be back the next morning. We'll we'll do emergency final action, and that allows us to have that vote right away. But generally, it waits a day. Does the Senate work the same way? Does it have to go through the committee, or is it just final action? Basically? I don't know what those guys do over there. It <laughs> looks boring, and it looks awful. Yeah. Um, but, no, they do have the same process. They have a committee process, and it comes out of committee and goes uh, goes to the Senate floor, and then they have their discussion on the Senate okay. floor. Um, I, I wanted to back way up to um, where you were talking about uh, essentially the the lady that kind of had the office and then she died and then mm-hmm. you kind of filled and then you you know ran for election and stuff so i have um some political aspirations of my own uh coming up uh in the coming years and i was just curious <clears throat> what are some things like when it comes to running for an office a public office that maybe surprised you that you never considered that you wish you would have done differently or lessons learned oh that's a lot um <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like putting you on the spot, right? You know, I don't know what level of office you're looking at, but I will say pretty much any office and state level office takes a lot more money than I than I think it should and a lot more money than than I thought. Um 
it takes a lot more time too. And there are a lot of details to be planned out on, on any campaign. You've got to think about yard signs. When you think about yard signs, you've got to think about how can I see this from the street? Most people want to put too much information on their yard sites. It's like, you know, name the office, uh, Kansas, then they have a couple of their taglines on it. Nobody sees that from the yeah, street. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, all they see is the name and <laughs> Yeah, the name. And that's all you want. Yeah, that's basically really... name and office. That's what yeah. kind of what I think you should do when it's driving by. Yeah. So you gotta think about that. You gotta think about where you're gonna order those. Um the if Which I heard is also extremely expensive. They're expensive. Yeah. yeah. And of course everything is more expensive now. It seems like all the printing costs are up and everything. Um ethics is uh a lot to learn about ethics and I got, you know, you, you can get tripped up on ethics over like dumb little things that you don't think about. Um, you can send out a fundraising request letter to maybe you're sending it out to your friends and your family and you're saying, maybe it's an email, right? Maybe you're sending an email to like 10 of your friends and you're saying, Hey, I'm thinking about running for office. Um, wonder if you could give me $50 or a hundred dollars to help me get my campaign stood up. Well, if you don't put on that, uh, that this was paid for by your campaign and here's your treasurer, you can get dinged for that. And the ethics, if somebody gets a hold of it and it gets to the ethics department, somebody makes an issue out of it, you'll, you'll get a formal reprimand for that. So that et- learning about ethics is, and, and the rules on that, cause they're complicated. And especially with social media, there's like sometimes on electronic media, you have to do an attribution one way. Sometimes on a different platform, you do it a different way. A lot of rules that that are hard to just at first blush to understand. But the, the ethics department in Kansas is very good. And anytime I've had a question, I just email them. I just email them and say, I don't know how this works. I don't know uh, how this is supposed to uh, how am I supposed to navigate this? What do I need to do? And they'll tell me just point blank what the answer is, whether I can do something, whether I can't do something. Um, and then they tell me why, and it makes perfect sense. Get a good treasurer. <laughs> that that can't be understated. Somebody that will take care of your receipts and expenditures and make sure that you're on track with that. That's a very, very, very important thing. Um, let me think of what else. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of all, but it's just – it's it, it you think you you th- and you think you get into it and you think well I'm going to do this because I care about my community or I care about this group of people or I have a passion for making a difference and and you really have to have something some drive like that to do it I think people that get into it and they're just like well I just want to you know do it because I think it, it would be fun or a good deal that I mean or you have some sort of an agenda to pass yeah 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 I think that. Doing it because you care about your community, doing it because you care about the people that you want to represent, I think is the best thing. And then I think, you know, the politics today is kind of tribal and people are kind of dug in. But I'd say it's way past kind of tribal. <laughs> yeah, I'm, try- I'm trying to be nice there. But yes, you're right. It's way past yeah. that. And it's really unfortunate because I think we we're all better off if we have an open mind about things right yeah, like if I, I if i can learn to understand somebody else's point of view and i can understand why they view the world the way they do and then maybe they can understand the way i view the world i do um i i think that we can solve m- most problems or at least we can get to a place where we're moving in that direction um you know i i facilitated a forum years ago on education and it was a mixed crowd so there's some people that are like Fund education all the way, all the time, at any level, no matter what. And another group who are like, yeah, this isn't working, and we keep throwing money at it, and we don't like that, and maybe we'd like to do more private schools or move some money around or whatever. And so I knew that I was dealing with this kind of crowd, and I was like, I don't want to start this conversation off with um, two sides fighting each other. So I started the whole thing with the question, do we think in 50 years we're still going to be educating children? And Everybody said yes. And I said, in 50 years, are we still going to view this as a public good? Is this something that we as taxpayers are going to want to invest in to make sure the kids are educated? Everyone said yes. I said, okay, well, we have common ground. Let's (laughs) start with that and then work our way backwards. Now the next question is, what do we do and what policies do we put in place to make sure that we're still doing that in 50 years and doing it the way that we would like that to be done? 
But what I didn't want was for everybody to get in their corners and start fighting about that because that is not productive. And and I think we have to start looking at longer time horizons on our big issues, and we have to start letting go of our kind of anger about things and just say, okay, w- what is the problem we're trying to solve, and how how can we do that? And that guy over there probably has some good ideas too, and that guy over there probably has some good ideas, and let, let's start seeing if there's any overlap between these good ideas, and we can start at that place and start building that scaffolding on the way out from that. Yeah, I think one of my biggest aha moments for me in, in politics and kind of uh, the thought thought process change for me was one time watching, I was watching C-SPAN of all things, don't judge me, um, and, and Nancy Pelosi had gotten up and she went over to the, you know, Republican side of the room and it was almost like they were aghast mm-hmm. that she'd come over there and she'd done what she did, like, you're on our side of the room kind of thing. And I was just like, wait a minute. Like, aren't we all generally kind of on the same team? Like maybe, maybe we have some differences in maybe the, the minutia house, but ultimately like, again, you know, like you said, the common ground, we, we all believe in the country we're in or else you probably wouldn't run for office. Like mm-hmm. as far as like just in America and it being prosperous and, and people being prosperous and all this other kind of stuff, we, we can agree on that. But I think it was it was just interesting to me to see that that divide mm-hmm. was just like it was like a it was like the Grand Canyon like there that might you might as well have been the Grand Canyon in the middle of that built uh, the middle of that room and it was like she jumped over it um, and I always thought it would be interesting to have like you know like seating arrangements like you know Republican Democrat Republican Democrat Republican Democrat because like then then you sit down and you get to be like hey uh, you know like hey Jason how did your kid do at uh, soccer this weekend. You know, you get to learn those things and see the person for the person mm-hmm. versus what letters next to their name. Yeah. And I think that would uh, I'm not saying like I'm advocating for legislature to take up seating arrangement as a bill. But, you know, of just uh, like you were talking about when it's that, that tribalism and that polarization of, you know, I think we've been conditioned for the last man decade or more of just us versus them mentality mm-hmm. and it's not getting us anywhere i mean yeah. there's a lot of people that just vote that way you know yeah. they just go to the the ballot box and they see r or d and they just vote yep. based on that you know and they don't do much more research and that is that's, so asinine yeah i mean it, and it happens all the time yeah <laughs> and, and for me it's really you know and, and i'm a democrat and i'm in an area that's predominantly republican and and that is especially frustrating for me because it's like it, if you would spend any time and figure out and talk to me or look at any of my material, you'd see that, you know, if you're if you're voting, if, if somebody's voting against me or because they're thinking of national Democrats, that we're I'm a world away from that, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. I'm in an area here where, um, you know, I, I mean, my friends are like I have a lot of Republican friends in, in Topeka. I have a lot of legislators uh, on the other side of the aisle who are good friends of mine. I enjoy them. We go out to dinner. We talk in the hallways. We talk on the floor. Uh, we text each other in the off season. Um, the, there's no need. And, and the, in Topeka, I mean, there's some of that. And, and I, unfortunately, I think it's getting increasingly worse. Um, but by and large, there's a large group of people who get along and they they break bread together, they ship, spend time together, they have conversations, and they try to understand each other. Um, it doesn't always translate into policy. There are different reasons for that. Um, but there is no reason for us to not like someone, not listen to someone, and not hear what they want to say just because of a political affiliation. That's that's only going to harm us if we continue that. Mm-hmm. I've always seen that in my, my mental picture. It is like a teeter-totter, you know, of like, you know, when you were talking about the education bill, you had those people that, that didn't want, like, no more money spent. It's not working. And then the other one's funded at every level. So, obviously, you've got two people sitting on opposite sides of the teeter-totter. And I think that's what, you know, the framers intended for our our government system and its checks and its balances and, and how things worked out is, you know, both sides of those spectrums have their problems. Mm-hmm. How do we meet in the middle to get the best of both worlds? I yeah. think was the original intent, the original way things were framed. And I think we're, you know, in, in some aspects, some people are getting away from are getting away from that. But I think there's also a little bit of a wake up and a revitalization, at least among, 
you know, my generation and you're what, 10 years younger than me mm-hmm. of, you know, kind of starting to see that of we're, we're not just looking at like that. We're, we're trying to look at the person for the person because we're tired of the, the old, you know, way of doing business kind of thing of like, I want somebody in there that brings, you know, honor and integrity back to that office. And so, um, yeah, that was my soapbox oh, moment like, there. But. I like, I like that. I mean, we have, we have, we have to get back to something better because the end point of tribalism and the end point of, I mean, there's no question where that ends, right? I mean, if we all go to our corners and we hate each other, we know where that ends. It ends up violent and yeah. it ends up another, very, civil, another civil war. Civil war yeah. It's very unpleasant. Right. And it's not good for anyone. It's, it's not good for anyone. Anyone trying to make a living, anyone trying to leave their life, live their life, anyone trying to raise kids, that is a bad situation. So if we don't want to end up there, we got to think about ourselves, think about how we approach our life and say, what is it that we can do individually? Because we can't individually change systems, but we change systems individually, right? I mean, collectively, people doing something different starts to change systems. So if more and more people say, I'm not, I'm not going to fall for this anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to look at people individually. I'm going to look at who they are. I'm going to compare their values to my values. I'm going to see what kind of person they are and I'm going to make a decision on that. And I'm not going to just blindly do this or that. Um, That'll get us to a better place, I think. Mm -hmm. And understanding even the people that are against education. I, I I struggle to understand that because I have my view of seeing education as an investment and and I don't, I, I want, kids to emerge from high school capable and competent and ready to go out and add to the wealth of our communities and to our country. And when I'm old, I want them to be able to take care of me and do the things that I want them to do. Right. I don't want to like die from a heart attack that could have been prevented when I'm 90 or whatever, you know? Um, but, but I do want to understand what, because clearly the people that have this other view, something's driving that. Right. And so I have a choice. I can look at that and say, well, those people suck and they just don't like this or that, you know, or I can try to understand what is it that is underneath that, right? If they really have these strong feelings, what is driving that? Yeah. Or or what three words can I fix in the statute? Yeah. (laughs) But something is there where they, they, they feel that the system's failing and they want to find a different way to make it work. And I think it comes out from our, from my side, it looks like, oh my gosh, they're, like every year it's this kind of attack on education. Um, but I, but I want to know, I, I think that they have a sincerely held idea under all of that, that something is horribly broken and wrong and they're trying to fix it. Well, I think it's also a concerted effort from above uh, the legislature and everything too of, you know, like for instance, like the, the things that are being pushed, like if we just want to use bugs, buzzwords like critical race theory mm-hmm. and transgenderism, stuff like that, that, that I think that, you know, they think that y'all are up there going, that's what we want. Like, you know, Etna, everybody up there is doing that. And that's what every school's doing and everything's doing. And I'm like, whoa, 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 take a step back. Like, just because this one school or this one teacher, or this one district or whatever, doesn't mean that that's necessarily happening here. Like, take a step back and, and figure out what's actually going on. And I think there's a lot of power to what you said, because I've said it on this podcast before of take a step back. And look at the community around you, the people around you, not what you're being told to see and believe. Mm-hmm. Like, talk to these people. That's the whole reason Nate and I started this podcast. The whole reason was to get out from behind the devices and do just this. Yeah. That was our whole reason for wanting to do it. I, I think it's fantastic. You know, during the campaign in 20, and that was a very divisive year. I mean, the, the 20 election was unlike anything I'd seen before. And, of course, there's every day you turn on your TV, there was like some – Something was happening, right? That was, mm-hmm. could scare you or make you mad or whatever. So this, I'm walking, I had this event downtown and this, this elderly lady come by and she was walking her little teacup dog and, uh, she stopped and talked to me and she just told me how scared she was and how terrified she was. She didn't, and she was telling me all this and, and I'm looking at her. I'm like, and I said, I said, well, aren't you lucky you live in a community where you, you can walk your dog around by yourself? Just, you know, and you're not scared of that. And she, you know, she did. She, because I, I felt it was important to point out the irony that even though she, what she saw on TV scared her and made her feel anxious, um, she knew that she lived in a community that, because clearly she's out walking and yeah, she's not scared right. and she's, 
you know, she's you're comfortable. Not, you're not having this conversation through a peephole on their door. Yeah. yeah. So I told her, I said, I just turn your TV off, man. <laughs> like oh, just best thing stop. you could do. Best thing you could do. Oh yeah. People absolutely. get so wrapped up in that, all the negative energy on the news and it just, I mean, it eats away at people's lives, you it, know? It does. Well, and it's kind of, it's not so unlike the addiction that we talked about. Like you start running down a track and then, then it's kind of a self-fulfilling and you'd have to do a whole nother op- episode to, to talk about to, with me about um, dark money that comes in and f- pushes some of these issues out, but also like the, the Google bubble, the Facebook bubble, all the algorithm bubbles that we live in. And I, I used to teach a class at the library on how to be a good news consumer. And I would talk to people about this and I would s- show them two screens and I would do a search for some name that would draw like a very, uh, marked reaction, right? Uh, Hillary Clinton, right? 2016. Um, and I said, this is what it looks like on my computer. And then this is what it looks like on my friend's computer. And you're get, you're getting fed completely different stories. And I said, mm-hmm. this the same technology that if I type in oil change only shows me where to get oil changes in Hutchinson, <laughs> which is a good thing, um, is not so good when it's feeding me more of what I've already indicated I I want. Confirming your bias. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's also interesting to see how much data has been mined from us to be able to do that because um, I did a search warrant on a rape investigation that I was working on two different Facebook accounts. And I was given in that search warrant, which was a very narrow window, I gave dates uh, like a like a three-day period. I got 29,000 pages back on each. So each one of those by themselves was 29,000. So I got 60,000 pages wow. worth of data on two people from like three or four days worth. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how much information is being gathered from us to be able to give those those results like what you're yeah. seeing. And you know, it's, what, it's unprecedented. How's the saying go? If if what you're using is free, you're the product. Exactly. <laughs> yep. That's exactly it. And my thing is, I would much rather pay a subscription service for my Google phone to be able to use it and be private or to pay a subscription service to Facebook and use it and and know that my information is not being sold or used or yeah. or used to, to basically market me. Like I... I, I'm a nerd, so I have like VPNs and things that encrypt my traffic and block trackers and block that kind of stuff that I put on my phone to just, which is like kind of a midget pissing on a forest fire sometimes. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's just kind of my way of just, I guess, trying to give my best to give the middle finger to that. Yeah. To just be who I want to be. Um, well, and have some agency, right? Yeah. I mean, you get the, the system that, you know, the, the, this has just kind of gotten away from us. I mean, it started and it seemed to, uh, like it wasn't nefarious, but then over time you find out that, you know, like the, what was the Cambridge Analytica thing? And that mm-hmm. was like all that information that was being pulled from people and it was being used. And yeah, I mean, over time, this has just gotten to a point where uh, we're involuntarily giving way too much information so i think anytime you get a chance to throw up a block or show some opposition to that that's good well i think that like we could continue having conversations for like hours and we would love to have you back on the podcast to do that because like there's so much more that i want to pick your brain on i want to hear more about the dark money yeah i would say i i I would love i would love to get into that Um, i do want to ask before we end yeah i want to talk about the. i'm in charge Okay. Okay. That's my bad. <laughs> I want to talk about like the medical marijuana stuff. Oh yeah. I completely, I completely forgot. I'm sorry about oh, that. No, I no. completely forgot about it. And like in your opinion, was that like election year politics or what was it egos? Was it I mean what what stalled that this year? What I was, I think it was a combination. I think that I told you the Senate's an odd group of people mm-hmm. and they, they seem to have more conflicts between personalities over there. Um, so I think that the Senate president is not really, I mean, he wanted to control this process and mm-hmm. I think he's not a particular fan of legalizing marijuana in any form. Um, and I think there were a few others that want to. And so that created some kind of divisions in the Senate. I don't know exactly what happened. I know that the house was very supportive of that. We passed medical marijuana last, last year and, uh, and wanted to get that done this year. And it looked for a while like there was some traction. Uh, there was, a, I think, a conference committee that was appointed, and they were going to have a discussion about Rob Olson's bill. Um, but it never went anywhere. And I don't know the ins and outs of that. I don't know. It, sometimes there are some 
things that are kind of held hostage and legislation that people really want. Will That's kind of what we thought happened was if you want this to go or you want this to be voted on, this other thing that I want that you don't want, push that through. That's kind of what we yeah. were thinking maybe happened. And, and you just don't know exactly what drives that. You know, I mean, I some so anything I say on that end would be speculative. I'm, I'm, I, I'll say this, you know. Sports wagering was a big thing this year. Yeah. I felt kind of like last year all the momentum was behind marijuana and legalization. And this year all of that kind of died and all the energy seemed to be behind sports wagering. Yeah. And I don't know what – I mean, I know sport, sports wagering has been out there for a number of years, as has marijuana. I don't know what changed that, but everything kind of got behind sports wagering this year. And I don't know – like I said, this would be speculative, but it feels a little bit like – well, if you you got to choose marijuana or sports wagering, uh, yeah, and and they said, well, sports wagering was the where all the energy was, so they said, let's do sports wagering and we'll let marijuana sit for a while. Um, the unfortunately is that it's the end of the session, so it'll all start over next year. Like we, we have some basis to go on because we had the bills from the from the previous session, but uh, it is incredibly frustrating that this hasn't been able to get through. I mean, we we know what people want. All the states around us are doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's probably, if I had to guess, that's what happened, is it got kind of held up in a political dispute. and Which um, is too bad because, you know, those political dis- disputes are kind of personal, you know, for elections and that kind of stuff. And the Kansans are the ones that suffer from those a little bit. That I, and it goes back to your point. I think this is what people are sick of, right? Like, I mean, there, there are people playing games with policy, but the, the policy – affects people very personally. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you if, if if you don't make a lot of money and you're I actually met a woman the other night and talked to her about this. If you're on social security and you're not getting any more money and food prices are going up, uh we're not giving her a food sales tax until next year. She needs it now. I mean she told me she quit buying meat and fruit because she can't afford it. Yeah. Um I've even had to have some of those same conversations with myself of like Ugh, you know, I, I can't afford this right now. Yeah. So people are making decisions. You you have a, a business built around, you know, C B D and hemp and your your every one of these laws directly affects you. And so if somebody's playing games with that like that twenty seven oh six, the House bill, I think that's what it was, the one that would bring us up to the federal regulation. Yeah. On, like Delta eight, Delta nine, just figure all that stuff out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the Delta eight thing is uh, I <laughs> Yeah, there is so much confusion over that. I think the, frankly, I think the attorney general's opinion was wrong, and I think that he reached way too far to to make that ruling on on Delta A. When you look in the statute, it doesn't specifically, it, it doesn't list Delta A as a as a controlled substance. So mm-hmm. I don't know where we got that, but those are the sort of things when those get caught up in an argument, those get caught up in a fight, and it's over politics, and it's over who's going to. Who's going to win and who's going to have control of a situation? Um, the on the ground result is that people can't stand up or expand their business. It's people can't afford the food that they need. It's uh, people go without health care coverage or hospitals close or any number of things out there. Um, it's or, or they're dealing with higher property taxes, whatever the case may be. And the, and I think people on the ground don't care about the politics of it. They yeah. just want things to work out. They want progress. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. I mean, that was us. Like, we had Delta 8 products, and we were sitting on these. And we're like, do we reorder more? Like, do we, like, dump it down the toilet, you know? I mean, we got people still coming in every day asking about Delta 8. We quit selling it. Yeah. Um, and we had to tell them, well, we, according to regulation, we can't. And they're like, well, this place up the street's still selling it. You know, why can't you? I was like, well... Eventually, they're going to get busted, you know, and it's just, it's a lost revenue stream. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. But it's better than losing everything in your business when they come raid it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has been some of that in Topeka where those CBD stores have been raided and they take everything that's got THC in it. Yeah. You know, like all of our products are full spectrum. Yeah. So that would happen to us. It's all gone. Yeah. And there goes everything. I mean, that, I don't, all of it. We don't come back from that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and that's the thing. And the other frustrating thing is, um, I am certain that people are still ordering Delta eight from out of state. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You know, and so, so we have the added pain that we're, we're not helping our local economies. We're not helping our local businesses. And that money is leaving our state and going 
to somewhere else and there's not going to be a good way for anybody to track that or know. And, and we could be, we could be helping people here. We could be selling that product here. And, you know, even, um, the Ellis County attorney who's kind of made a stink about the Delta eight, but he sent me an email and said that like the reason he's doing it is he wanted some clarification on updating on the statute because he did not think that it should be, uh, illegal. He and, actually came on a, uh, a board meeting with us in the coalition did he? and talked about it. He's like, this is not what I intended at all. You know, like I did not want this to negatively affect the industry like it has. I wanted clarification and things that happen at the Capitol for medical marijuana and this and that for that to be pushed through. And so, that didn't happen. So he was prosecuting, trying to get clarification and, un- and change at the legislative level. That's kind of the story. Isn't you kind of playing with people's lives there? I'm, well, he a- started with a letter warning that that based on his reading, based on his reading of the law, if if the legislature didn't intervene and address this issue with Delta Eight, he tried to throw out a warning that said, based on my reading of the law, I will have no choice but to prosecute Delta Eight cases, and he sent that out in a, in an attempt, I think, to kind of throw a warning out that said this is the way we're reading the law this is the way district attorneys are reading the law and we we need we need some clarification on this well the clarification that came was not what we had hoped for it was clarification from the attorney general who issued a very very long opinion uh that said no the delta eight is not legal and uh and then that's when he came out and said like that's not what i was trying to do i was trying to get i was trying to get attention to this and trying to get some action on that we talked about that in agriculture i thought we had a moment where we were going to get a fix to that and the chair of that committee seemed very open to that and he was you know we had talked about pulling in the ellis county attorney and having that conversation and saying what do we need to do to change that and uh and it was another one of those things that sometimes you have those conversations and then they take that conversation somewhere else and then it just disappears (laughs) And that's kind of what happened on that. Mm-hmm. Huh. Well, so um, if people were to like look you up, look up your campaign, or look, even look up your podcast, like uh, how do we find you? What social media are you on? What websites do you have, et cetera? Just kind of let people know. My website is propsforprogress.com, and that has most of my basic information. And you want to spell that too, just to make sure. It's P R O B S T, four spelled out F O R, progress, P R O G. ESS <laughs> forgot to spell for a minute. Um, so and then dot com. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Instagram, and I'm on Twitter. I have a couple others too. I have I actually have a Snapchat and a TikTok, but I don't do anything with them. And I stop. <laughs> actually, you talk about algorithms. The TikTok al- yeah. algorithm freaks me out. Um, it's too much. And I spent a little time watching videos and then I felt like it was inside my brain and I didn't want that anymore. <laughs> um, but the handle I use for almost everything is that guy in Hutch. So if you do the, that guy in Hutch handle, uh, you'll find, you'll find me there. And that, uh, and that's also, uh, my podcast is that podcast in Hutch. And you can find that on any of the major platforms. Um, prop and, and my email is that guy in Hutch at gmail.com. Or my state house email, if it's official business, is jason.probst at house.ks.gov. Okay, cool. We appreciate you taking the time on here. We want to be, like, really mindful of your time. And, you know, we 100% we want to have you back on here because there's, like, so many other cool things that I think we I'd could talk it. about. Um, but, uh, you know, we really appreciate it. Um, is there any final thoughts, anything we haven't addressed, anything that you, you kind of wanted to talk about or get out there before we before we sign off? Um, you know, there's an election this year. There's a constitutional amendment on in August, and there's going to be more constitutional amendments in November. Um, there's going to be state house races. There's going to be a race for governor. There's going to be a race for uh, other statewide offices. Um, nothing changes if you. The least you can do for democracy is vote. If you if you if you can vote, you're doing one thing. But then beyond that, find the issues you care about. Find other people who care about them too. Get yourselves organized, uh, promote those, make sure that people know that you care about them. And that's how change happens. Uh, Sitting around and 
uh, liking tweets doesn't do a thing and griping about it doesn't do a thing. Amen. Yep. Amen. I, I would go on to say that it's like your duty as a United States citizen to educate yourself and go vote. Yeah. You know? Well, and, mean, and today's day and age of, of technology, you can do that easily. Mm-hmm. You can have your phone notify you every time your your legislature votes on something like those that technology is out there yeah yeah it is it's important to know because you know in the educating yourself is a big part of that because uh the information as we talked about earlier is not always good and then if you're getting not good information and you keep clicking on it then you're going to get more not good information and it, and it just kind of snowballs from there. So, mm-hmm. and you know certainly someone like me and I think I would say this of most legislators call them they'll they'll answer your phone or they'll they'll call you back but you you can you can call your legislator and ask any question you want and most of them are pretty responsive i think yeah i've, I've always had good luck anytime i've i've reached out my email on some things and i've always had really good luck on getting a response yeah I and it always hasn't from... been the response that i've wanted each time but yeah. but i mean at least it was something yeah no, michael absolutely. murphy's my re- representative and I, he responded to my email pretty fast actually yeah. it was within like an hour he responded to me so that's good he's that he's doing better than i do i try to do it within a couple of days but i try to get back yeah <laughs> so all right well everyone thanks for taking the opportunity to listen to the higher points podcast we're really humbled by uh you know jason coming on here and spending his time as well as y'all spending your time to listen to us uh we just look at looking forward to having those genuine conversations with everybody don't forget to leave us a rating or review those go a long way Check us out on Facebook at the Higher Points Podcast, Instagram at the Higher Points, and our website at uh, thehigherpoints.com. We appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. We'll catch up with you next time. Mm-hmm.